Morning. Now, if I said to you that the answer is 42, does anybody know what the question is? You've got to be of a certain age, I think, here. Chris? It's the, it's the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Or so said those in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which, for those of you who don't know, was a sort of cult TV, TV series from, I think, about the 80s, when space travellers spent the whole time searching for the answer to this question and having a variety of answers on the way. And the series ended with the answer, 42. And the team seemed to be very puzzled. And it sounds like a really important question, doesn't it? What is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? But the answer doesn't seem to make any sense and is really irrelevant. And this passage feels a bit like that question, what is the answer to ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? But the answer is probably the most important one that you can give. It's a very short passage. It's just eight verses and 172 words. But our eternal destiny hinges on our response to what we read here. Just want to put it in context. I'm going to go a bit through the passage and, and sort of go through each verse and, and help us to understand what's going on. So when we reach this passage, Jesus has been teaching the people through the parables. We've heard some of those over the last few weeks. He's healed people, he's, healed, he's fed 5,000, he's walked on the water, and he's just been teaching in his hometown and the surrounding areas of Galilee. He's been teaching a, a wide number of people. And the Pharisees come to him and ask him for a miraculous sign, and, and then they'll believe. He's just fed 5,000 people and walked on the water. He's healed people. What else were they expecting? And many people listening to Jesus would have been confused. Should they believe their religious leaders, the Pharisees, or, or should they believe Jesus? And it's a bit like that today. People see Jesus at work, but refuse to believe I just want to tell you a short story uh, that illustrates this about a couple I knew from my old church. A lady, and we'll, we'll call her Pat, had been diagnosed with a brain tumour and as a result had been exploring whether God could be any help and had become a brand new Christian. Her husband was a non-believer. An appointment had been made for her to attend London Hospital for surgery to remove the tumour. A huge undertaking and she was due to report on the Monday morning. And the couple decided to go for a, away for a weekend together and spend some time talking and walking along the beach. And Pat became tired and decided to return to the hotel while her husband continued his walk. On the way back to the hotel, Pat became convinced that God said to her that she'd been healed. And she was so sure about this that she could hardly wait for her husband to return to tell him what had happened. And I think he humoured her, thinking maybe that she'd gone a bit strange. And on the Monday morning, they duly reported to the hospital where she was to have some final scans before the surgery that week. And guess what? There was nothing to find. She had no surgery and is still alive and serving God and telling people about him today, some 30 or so years later. Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that this would have been, had a serious impact on her husband. But no, he was obviously pleased. But he refused to attribute the miracle of Pat's healing to God or to give his life to Jesus. I'm pleased to say, actually, that just a few years ago, he began to go along to church with Pat and is now a believer. But all those years when he could have known God and served him were wasted. Why is that? Why? When even when people have seen miracles, do they not believe? Could it be because they know that it will demand something from them, surrender of their lives, that they'll have to give a response to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? We'll come back to that sort of thought in a minute, but we'll back, go back to the passage now. So after this encounter with the Jewish leaders demanding a miraculous sign, Jesus then travels north about 40 miles to Caesarea Philippi. It's probably about three days' walk. This was Gentile territory, and he went there just with his close band of friends. And that's where we start today's reading. 
The disciples have, been, have seen what Jesus has been doing, and we can see from the passage that Lee spoke on a couple of weeks ago, where Jesus walks on the water, that they're beginning to get who he is. In Matthew 14, it said, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. But Jesus was coming towards the time when he set his face towards Jerusalem for the last time and head towards his inevitable death. He needed to know what people who'd heard his teaching, and more importantly, his close group of friends, his his close group of disciples thought of him, had they really begun to understand yet. And so he asks his first question, who do people say the Son of Man is? They'd obviously heard talk amongst the, the wider group of followers, because disciples were able to give the answer, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. No one from the larger group of followers was openly declaring Jesus to be the promised Messiah, but they'd quite obviously been struck by his authority, his teaching, his suffering at the hands of leaders, just like some of the prophets from the Old Testament times. But now Jesus comes to the question that probably matters most to him. He's heading for a very tough time and needs to know that all his teaching, mentoring, praying, has had an effect. He needs to know that his friends will be with him. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Now the question is directed to all the close disciples. The you is plural. And Peter answers on behalf of the whole group. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. I sort of want to hit the pause button here on this verse, and we'll come back to it in a bit. But I just want to carry on and look at the context for the rest of the passage and what it might mean for us. So Peter gives his answer, and it seems for once that Peter's got something right. Although he's answered for the group, Jesus commends him for finally understanding Understanding that came to him not from trying to work it all out in human terms, but through the acceptance of the Father's revelation. And this is important for us too. How many times have you heard people say that their faith moved from their head to their heart? They didn't just know about God, but knew him as their father, hearing his voice and being changed by his spirit. Until we have that heart knowledge, it's difficult for us to keep going when things get tough. Facts and figures won't comfort or strengthen us, but the knowledge of the Father's love for us and his presence with us will. Jesus then goes on to endow Peter with special responsibility. He says he will build his church on this rock. And most of you will know that Peter in the Greek, um, which is originally Cephas in Aramaic, means rock. So Jesus is using his name to make a point. But we must be clear, though, that it's Jesus who will build the church, and it will be his church and not Peter's. Elsewhere in scripture, it's clear that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles, all the apostles. Talking to the Christians at Ephesus, Paul says, so then, you are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. And elsewhere, Paul describes Jesus as the foundation in 1 Corinthians 3. For no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. Many seemingly successful church leaders have started off well, but have gone astray, thinking that it is their church, their efforts that are building their church. And we all need to remember that it is Jesus' church. As Anglicans, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, or whatever... And wherever in the world, in England, Luton, or indeed here at Christ Church in Bushmead, this is Jesus' church, and we need to look to him for strength and vision, guidance and truth. The word church is only used twice in the Gospels, once in Matthew 18, where it talks about discipline in the church, and there it means the local congregation. And in our passage today, where Jesus is talking about the whole church, non-denominational, international, worldwide church of God. And it is this church that he will not allow the gates of hell to come against. 
we might look around and see that the church in the UK and other parts of the world is in a sorry old state. Numbers of people attending church are in decline and churches are closing. The full gospel is not being preached and it indeed looks as if the gates of hell are prevailing. But if we consider Christ's church worldwide, we see a different picture. And this is from uh, that uh, well-known store of accurate facts, but I think it's okay in this, this, this in Wikipedia. It says, Christian population growth is the population growth of the gro- global Christian community. According to a 2011 Pew Research Center survey, there were 2.2 billion Christians around the world in 2010, more than three times as many as the 600 million recorded in 1910. And according to a 2015 Pew Research Center study, by 2050, the Christian population is expected to be 2.9 billion. Protestantism is one of the most dynamic religious movements in the contemporary world. From 1960 to 2000, the global growth of the number of reported evangelical Protestants grew three times the world's population rate and twice that of Islam. Other similar studies are available. So we need to be encouraged and to trust God for his word on this one, no matter what the local situation looks like. Let me move on to verse 19, which says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And that's a strange verse. What on earth does it mean? Well, some time ago, there was a fad for Christians to bind things they didn't like in prayer and to loose things they did like. So people were binding illnesses, unemployment, poor relations, evil spirits, anything at all, thinking that they were using this scripture correctly. And I've had to do a bit of research to see what Jesus was really saying. And my understanding is this. Jesus commissioned the apostles to take the gospel to the whole world, to the Jews and the Gentiles. And he has given the keys of the kingdom to them. Perhaps as, as the Lord of the manor might give the keys to the house, of, to the, um, give the keys to the house, to the steward. It's still Jesus' kingdom. But the keys refer to the preaching and receiving of the gospel. Those that receive the gospel will enter the kingdom of heaven. And the binding and loosing runs alongside this. Those who accept the gospel preached by the apostles and subsequently by every one of us are set free to live in heaven for eternity. And the final verse of our passage is also a strange one. Why did did Jesus tell the disciples not to tell anyone who he was? Surely that was the whole point, that people should know that Jesus is the promised Messiah. But it's not the first time that you read of Jesus asking them not to reveal who he is. After Jesus had healed Jairus' daughter, it says in Mark 5, Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Then again in Mark 7, when Jesus heals a deaf man. And again in Matthew 9.30, when Jesus heals two blind men. And there are other occasions when Jesus quite clearly commands people not to tell anyone what has just happened. To help us to understand this, we need to go back to a few verses leading up to today's passage, when the Jewish leaders asked Jesus for a miraculous sign. Jesus commanded his disciples not to tell anyone what has been revealed to them, and declared by Peter, is not an attempt to keep the message quiet or his identity a secret, but a refusal to bow to the demands of the people to reveal his authority with a miraculous sign. He wanted people to come to faith in him as Peter and his disciples had done through a response to the revelation that God had given them, a response based on faith and relationship not on whizzy demonstrations of power. After all, as I hope the story of my friend who was healed of a brain tumour shows, miracles alone will not convince people to surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus. So that's looking at the passage as a whole, and I hope what I've said helps you to understand it a little better. But now I want to press the rewind button and return to verse 15. This is such a rich passage. It's full of significance for the apostles then, for Jesus, for the world at that time, and for us here today. I just want to show you um, a a short video clip and see what people say in answer to the question, who do you say that I am? Question, okay? Is it your 
opinion. Who is Jesus? See, now, see, now you won't start trouble. It's a myth created by man in order to control society. I don't, I don't consider Jesus my savior or my spiritual leader. He is a spiritual leader and right. one of the spiritual leaders I learned from. Who is Jesus? In Who your opinion? was he? Who was Who he? Who was he? Was a man. He was a man. Okay. Absolutely. Your opinion. Jesus is. In my opinion, he's everything around here. He's spiritual, everything, earth, water, fire, everything. Jesus is all that's good, all the things that are positive and affirmative in life. Uh, that's Jesus. I believe he's a higher power in the form of a man. Everyone else walking around, there's not another Jesus, there's just one. So yeah, I believe he definitely did something. Yeah, uh, like on, Jesus like, is not a person. He's not a person, okay? Okay, so do you believe he was a man or just like some higher power or? No, I don't believe in. Don't believe he even no. existed? No. Okay. No. Jesus is um, our savior. Jesus is everything. He's the reason why we live. He's the reason why um, we get to do the things that we do in life. He's my heart and he's what I speak through my poetry, through my work, through my everyday life. That's Jesus. There's some uh, answers to the question, who is Jesus? So it doesn't matter what the answer to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is, question is, even though they spent ages trying to discover it, but it does matter how we answer the, the question when Jesus asks us, who do you say that I am? It's really important that we know in our hearts how we answer that question. Jesus isn't looking for historical facts, born in a stable, suffered, died, and was buried. He wants to know what our response is to his call on our life. Do we think he's a good teacher? Following him will make us better people. Do we think that he has spiritual powers which we can access for our healing? Do we think he was a prophet who has something to say about the past and the future? These are, these are partly true, but what Jesus is really looking for is whether we consider him to be our Lord, our Savior, someone who loves us unconditionally and wants a close relationship with us, someone who loves us so much that he died for us so that we can be forgiven and have eternal life and be with him forever, someone who wants to speak to us personally and loves to hear us speaking to him, someone who, who we can surrender our whole lives to, trusting he has a good plan for each of us. Let's just take a moment to think about how we answer that question. Um, I, a, an old vicar of mine used to say, if you're doing a talk, you have to go there first. And so I've had to think about this question this week. And I found it very hard to get past the words, he's my Lord, he's my Savior, and try and think, what does that actually mean for me? What does that mean? If, if Jesus were to say, you know, who do you say that I am? Who is he in my life? So just take a moment to, just to, to think about that. Because this has an impact on our daily walk with God. Our response to that question will affect our eternal destiny. Whether we will be with Jesus forever in eternity or somewhere else. As you know, church attendance on its own won't do it. Doing good deeds and being a good person won't do it. Even reading our Bible regularly won't do it on its own. Of course, all these things are good. What Jesus is looking for is that our heart, is, he's looking for our heart response, a submitting of our lives to him. Of course, if we're sure about our answer, then that will help us to answer the questions of our friends and families and colleagues when they ask us, who is Jesus? So as you go through this week, Allow Jesus to ask you the question over and over again. Who do you say that I am? Put your name before the sentence. Helen, who do you say that I am? Make it personal. And even if you've been a Christian for a long time, it's still a question worth asking. God may give you a new revelation of himself. And of course, we can learn the correct answers. But what we really need to be asking is whether our lives reflect our answer. Keep asking the question until you can say with certainty, along with Peter, 
who gave up everything to follow Jesus. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who has the words of eternal life. Amen.